That's good. That's good. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn with me tonight to the book of Psalm, chapter 76. Psalm 76 and verse number 1. Psalm 76, 1. In Judah is God known. His name is great in Israel. In Salem also is his tabernacle, and his dwelling place in Zion. There break the, he the arrows of the bow, the shield, and the sword, and the battle. Selah. Father, bless your holy word now. In thy righteous name, amen. Uh, Forty-nine years ago, I was working at the Aluminum Company of America, Alcoa, and it was a good job. People, uh, people would love to have had that job, paid well, had a lot of benefits in, uh, attached to it, so it was a good job. I remember one night we had worked overtime, and I heard some, I mean blasphemy, I'm talking about the strong stuff, I'm talking about the stuff you hear out here in the beer joint and down on Hayboy Corner, as bad as it gets. And I looked off at the distance to see where it was coming from. Who in the world, I thought to myself, is, is cussing like this? And lo and behold, one of the men doing the cussing was a preacher in the little church that I used to go to all the time when I was a little boy out in uh, Louisville, that area. Uh, when I saw him, I said to myself, something wrong here. You, you're, you're deceived. There's something bad wrong. Bad, bad wrong. Well, that kind of filth coming out of your mouth, uh, it's obvious that your heart is not right with God in any way, shape, or form. Now, my wife was pregnant at that time with, with my daughter, Pamela. She was born in December of 1969. And uh, Alcoa picked up the medical bill for it. Uh, they transferred me to the North Plant at Alcoa, kept the same pay, and uh, while I was at the North Plant, uh, they assigned me to this fellow who had a big pot on the side, a huge pot, and he had this flame shooting into that pot. And what he was doing was reclaiming aluminum, reclaiming it, because bits and pieces were thrown in there. They'd melt it down and, I guess, put it into ingots again, and sent it back out through the plant. And so I sat there and I was amazed. I tried to learn everything I could about that. that marvel, I marveled at him shooting that flame into that. But it didn't, wasn't long until they took me out of there and they handed me a broom. I lasted two weeks. I said, you can have Alcoa. Two weeks with a broom. That's all I could stand. I went back to, on the line as a line mechanic. I went back to working on Volkswagens. And... Uh, professional mechanic. That's what I was when my daughter was born. Made a good living. And I got around people at that time who knew the Lord. I was drawn to them. We'd go eat lunch together and we'd talk about the Lord. We had something in common. I had nothing in common with these religious people, though, that cursed and blasphemed God. Did you know that 26,000 different denominations called themselves Christians? 26,000? 26,000. And every one of them professed to be right or they wouldn't have that identity. They say we're wrong and they're right. In other words, 25,999 of them say they're right and we're wrong. Have you ever wondered about what you believe, whether it's true or not? I do. I examine what I believe. What got me started in this was a personal encounter with God. 1973, a personal encounter with God. At that time, I didn't know the Lord in 1969, but I knew something was wrong with this guy because I listened to him preach when I was a little boy. Going to, I used to go to Bible school there, vacation Bible school. I knew there was something bad wrong with this guy talking like that. But in 1973, I came into a personal encounter with God. Church I went to at that time had a lot of people in it, a lot of them good people. A lot of them religious people. 
when God saved me in that church, some of those people were drawn to me and some of them were drawn away, pushed away from me. They treated me like I had the plague. The spirit that is in you is what will witness that you are children of God. I've been to about every kind of church you can think of. I've told you about it. I've been to Beachy Amish. I've been down to uh, Charleston, South Carolina. We went into the, uh, uh, what was that down there? I forget now. Moravian? Huguenot. The Huguenot. That, thank you, brother. The Huguenots. The Huguenots. They were persecuted in France and massacred one day. I've been to the Huguenot church, been here, been there, been to the old-fashioned uh, five-point Calvinist church. I've been to Catholic mass. <laughs> uh, uh, I have, I've been everywhere. But it's never one time moved me from what I am and what I believe. And it's good that you examine it and you know what you have. Now, tonight I'm going to take you up to something. I'm trying to lay the foundation for you. And to get you to understand what I'm trying to say, I want you to think. That's to me, you know, the, the sad thing is as I preached to you this morning is that most Americans are like sheep. They're simply led around by their nose. They don't know anything. They don't want to know anything. But as a Christian, you should want to know. Turn to the book of Revelation chapter number 1 and verse number 8. Revelation 1.8. That's a powerful, powerful statement in Scripture. Written by the Apostle John, 90 A.D., somewhere along in there. Revelation 1.8. Brother Seals, do you have it? Read it for us. The who? All right, now listen to this Bible. And to the angel of the congregation in Smyrna write, These are the things that he says, the first and the last, who became dead and came to life again. That's it. Well, what happened to the Almighty? These people don't believe that Jesus is the Almighty. Guess whose Bible I've got in my hand? You got it. The New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. Turn to John chapter number 1. Now, these are only a couple of places I picked out for you. John 1 and verse 1. Gospel of John 1, verse 1. All right. Brother Valance, would you like to read that for us? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All right. That's pretty plain, isn't it? Okay. Now... In the beginning, the Word was, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Okay. Now, these people are willfully ignorant of the Scriptures. Okay. Any place in the New Testament that attests to the deity of Christ, they're going to rip it out. Why? Because they have a pre conceived notion of his identity if it doesn't match that out with it. Now, don't ever get caught up in the kind of thinking to where you reject something just because it's not part of the party line. Okay? Think. Now, I'm going to give you some stuff here in just a few minutes. It's, it's, it, it may make you nervous. It may blow your mind. It may, you may leave out of here tonight and you may say to yourself, what in the thunder is that preacher talking about? But I want you to listen to me tonight. Now, to get you there, let's go back to what we've talked about, Mount Moriah. You remember I told you that Mount Moriah is the holiest site on the face of this earth in Judaism. The reason it is is because that's where the temple of God was built. Mount Moriah. That's where Abraham took Isaac to offer him as a sacrifice. That is where Abraham met Melchizedek, the, the priest of the Most High God. Melchizedek is the name. Melchizedek mean, Melech in Hebrew is king. Hamalek, the king. Hamalek David, uh, Hadavid is the king David. Sedek is righteous, the righteous one. So Melchizedek is the righteous priest king because he offered sacrifices. So he's a priest and he's a king. And Abraham paid tithe to him because Melchizedek was greater than Abraham. And he was king over Salem. Salem is the ancient Jerusalem. Remember that. The word Salem means peace. 
Yerushalayim, the city of peace. So he is the priest of El Elyon, the Most High God. The God who has majesty and sovereignty over all the earth. So before he has revealed himself as Jehovah, the covenant-keeping God, here he is to these people, before they come into that, he's El Elyon. He's the Most High God. He Then he revealed himself as the covenant-keeping God to Abraham and to his descendants. Because these are the ones he made the covenant with. But before he made the covenant with, with, uh, with, with, with Abraham and his descendants, he was God over all the earth. Because he was the creator God. And there's none beside him. Moriah is the threshing floor of Arun of the Jebusite. The th threshing floor is where you separate. The wind blows the chaff away. The wheat is kept or the grain is kept. So therefore it is the picture of the work of the Holy Spirit of God at Moriah. And it is at Moriah where the Holy Spirit does his work. Because that's how you get saved. By the work of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Not by intellectualism. Not by education. I'm for all of it. But my friend, that will not save you. It takes the work of the Holy Spirit. The Lord said in John 16, When He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. Then He said He will convince the world of sin because they believe not in Me. So the threshing floor of Arun of the Jebusite was there at Moriah. About 1000 B.C. David bought this. He didn't conquer it. He bought it because it had to be redeemed. Because it was the mountain of redemption. Mount Moriah. So he bought it. Amen. Zion is the mountain of strength. He took that mountain and overpowered it. But he did not take Moriah. He bought it. And so there's a beautiful picture in that. In the redemption of our souls. The strong Jewish tradition says that uh, Jacob's dream was fulfilled at Moriah where he saw the ladder into heaven. Can't prove that one way or another. The southern slope of Moriah is Mount Zion. And that is also the location of the city of David. It was there that Isaac was bound and offered up as a sacrifice to God. Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians in 586 B.C. That's an important date. The ten northern tribes had fallen in 722 B.C. But in 586 B.C., Jerusalem, Moriah, fell to the Babylonians. Nehemiah rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. It fell again in 70 A.D. to Titus, a Roman. It fell again in 135 A.D. to Hadrian. Hadrian changed the name of the city to Aelia Capitolina, changed the name of the land to Palestine, and then renamed uh, and, and, then, and then crucified any Jew he could find anywhere around there. There's a prophecy of the restoration of the land in Ezekiel chapter 48, verse number 35. It will come to pass exactly as God said it would. The prophecy in Revelation chapter number 11 and verse number 8 tells you its spiritual condition. The scripture says it is spiritually Sodom and Egypt. Revelation 11 and verse number 8. The word translated spiritually. I just looked it up. I was going through the text. I wasn't looking for anything in particular. But, but the word pneuma tikos popped out at me. And I knew the word pneuma means spirit. That's the way you translate it. So the King James translators translated it correctly when they said spiritually it is Sodom and Egypt. But then the NIV comes along and translates pneumatikos as figuratively or a figure. Changing it, softening it, taking the bite away from it. And that's exactly the way these new Bibles are headed. You see, this one is long past all of them as far as debauchery is concerned. At the bottom of the barrel, the New World Translation is a piece of garbage, folks. But I got everything in the world in my office, and I won't, I won't turn anybody loose on these books. I got all kinds of stuff back there. But I appeal to it on occasion for reference like I did tonight. But I wouldn't want you reading that junk. That's garbage. That's not the Word of God. <laughs> but in any event... <clears throat> He prophesied in Zechariah chapter number 12 and verse number 3 that Jerusalem would become a burdensome stone. We talked about this past Wednesday night. Is it a burdensome stone? These Palestinians are over there. Over 50 of them have been killed. We've got nations coming out against, against the United States for moving their embassy to Jerusalem. Is Jerusalem the capital of Israel? Yes. Always has been. 
It's been the capital of Israel ever since David moved it from Hebron to Jerusalem when he overthrew the Jebusites and drove them out of, the land, out, of, out of that city. It became the capital of Israel and has been ever since then. How long ago was that? 3,000 years ago, folks. Jerusalem became the capital of Israel, always has been, always will be. When the UN is nothing but a dust pile in history, Jerusalem will be the capital of Israel. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and I hope the good old US of A is around then, but I'm going to tell you one thing. These are his ancient people and they will inherit this earth. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is about when they accept their king. So we've moved our embassy to Jerusalem. And I'm glad. I'm all for it. I'm 100% in support of it. I support the nation of Israel. Well, don't you think that they've returned in apostasy? Sure they have. Don't you think they need a revival from God? Sure they do. Well, how's that going to happen, preacher? When he shows up visibly and appears to them and they see the nail prints in his hands and in his side, they're going to ask him where he got this and he's going to say, I got him in the house of my friends. And the Bible says they're going to mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son. Remember this though, folks. There is no religion on this earth with any of their religious books that have anything to do with this Bible except Israel. The Old Testament of the Jew is your Old Testament. I'm not talking about the Talmud. I'm not talking about the Kabbalah. I'm talking about the Bible, the Tanakh. Their Old Testament is your Old Testament. Now think about that for a moment. You mean to tell me, preacher, then, that we have roots with Israel? Amen. <laughs> Amen. We have. You better believe we have. When we get up and preach about the Ark of the Covenant and the table of showbread, we, get it, we preach about the Sabbath and all of these other things. Where do you think this came from? It came from the Old Testament Scriptures. When the Lord Jesus told the, two on the, told the, he told the Pharisees, He said, Search the Scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify. What scripture is he talking about? He's talking about Genesis through Malachi. He's talking about the same book you have. And then the two on the road to Emmaus, the Bible said he opened the scripture, and he began to show them, and their hearts burned within them when he presented to them Christ in the Bible, which was the Old Testament. It's a beautiful thing. Now, I said all of that to lay the groundwork for what I'm about to say. Now, many of you folks... No, a Seventh-day Adventist. All right. Let me say this right up front. The Apostle Paul made it very clear in the book of Romans. One man esteemeth one day above another. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. If some man wants to set aside Saturday and worship on Saturday, I have no right to criticize him. None. 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 But he has no right to criticize me if I worship on Sunday. The early church met on the first day of the week. They began to establish a precedent for us. They took up the offerings on the first day of the week. Christ rose from the dead on the first day of the week. So we've got a lot of reasons why we meet on the first day of the week. But let's say you meet every day. <laughs> Is there anything wrong with that? No, absolutely not. So when it, when it comes down to the day, to me it's a non-issue. Unless you make more of that day than you should make of that day. That day, that day is a type of the rest that Christ gives us when He came, and the Apostle argues that in Hebrews chapter number 4. He talks in detail about a day, about a day set aside, and that Christ is our rest and the fulfillment. And no day could give you the rest that Christ can give you before, because if you're born again, you are resting in the Lord Jesus and His finished work. Amen. But they couldn't do that in the Old Testament. Because the New Testament and the New Covenant had not been ratified. It was not made legal till the blood was shed at the cross. Amen. Amen. So the reason I say all of that is how many ever heard of Ron Wyatt? All right, a few of you have. Good. Now Ron Wyatt says things that causes people to, some people to just go into absolute screaming mad. But some people support what he says. Let me say this right now at the beginning of what I'm going to be reading to you about Ron Wyatt. I neither try to promote him or denigrate him. The whole point is to make you think. To make you think. If you'll open your mind and pray and say, Lord, show me wondrous things out of thy law. Teach me. 
Teach me, are these things true? Give me a discerning heart. Give me a desire to learn. And then God will guide you. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. Are these things true? I don't know if they're true or not. They've never been disproven. But let's get into what he's talking about. Because I think it's important. I think it's very important. In searching the Bible, Ron found the last mention of the Bible of the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, was located in Jerusalem about the year 621 B.C. All right. When did Nebuchadnezzar, as I told you just a moment ago, when did they come in and raid the city and carry off the holy implements? What year was it? 586 B.C. So we're looking at 621 B.C. Now, how many of you believe tonight that the Jewish people are smart people? How many of you tonight believe that the Jews could see the coming storm? Sure they could. Sure they could. This is why the Lord rebuked them for running down to Egypt to get help against their enemies. He rebuked them because they knew the storm was coming and so they ran off instead of trusting Jehovah. Here they are running off to everything under the sun. All right. We establish the fact that they know that the storm is coming. And they have items that are of unbelievable value. The most holy thing in Israel, folks, is the Ark of the Covenant. Now, Hollywood's made millions of dollars off of, um, what is it, the Raiders of the Lost Ark and, and movies about the Ark. All right, and they take an element of truth and they build this storyline from it and make money. But the bottom line is that since 621 B.C., no one knows where the Ark of the Covenant is. Now, there's been quite a few documentaries made about Aksum, Egypt. Ethiopia, not Egypt, Ethiopia. How many ever heard of them? There's a church in Ethiopia that has a man who lives in that church 24-7. He never leaves the spot. He lives his life out inside that building. According to these Ethiopian Christians, they say that the Ark of the Covenant is inside that building. The story goes that Menelik, who was a product of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, when she visited with him, he impregnated her. She had a son. His name is Menelik. And that when Israel saw the oncoming storm, that they called for Menelik. And Menelik went back up into Israel, and he got the Ark of the Covenant, and he carried it down to Ethiopia, and he put it inside this building, and it's been in there ever since then. Now, is that true or not? Well, how do you test something? They won't let you inside. They've been, the people have tried to bribe them <laughs> and everything possible. Because, folks, do you realize how important it would be if you could produce the, uh, the ancient Ark of the Covenant that is 3,000, over 3,000 years old? It goes all the way back. Who made the Ark? Barzillai. Barzillai. When did he make that Ark? He made it not for the temple. He made it for the tabernacle. He made it for the tabernacle. In other words, right after they were brought out of Egypt, it was made for the tabernacle. The Ark of the Covenant has been around a long time. But in any event, 621 B.C., this Ark is last mentioned. It, it disappeared from the divine record sometime between 621 and 586 B.C. Since the temple was completely destroyed, there is no doubt that it was not there after that time. So, for example, the temple of Herod, the temple that Christ went into 2,000 years ago when he drove the money changers out, there was no ark in that temple. Herod's temple. No ark. We are told in the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 28, that everything taken from Babylon... From the house of the Lord will be returned. Since the ark wasn't among the returned items, this indicates it was never taken from there. Shishak and Sinatra also took items from the house of the Lord, but they did not include the ark of the covenant. They never laid their hands on it. So the bottom line is that the Jews seeing the coming storm took that ark and hid it in a location that absolutely defied finding it would not be found now when you go to Moriah you go to Moriah I stayed in a motel hotel right on the upper side of the Kidron Valley it's called five arches I think is the name of it seven arches or whatever it is you can sit there in that hotel and you look across the Kidron Valley and you can sit there and you can see the ancient walls of Jerusalem 
You can see Al Aska Mosque and you can see the Temple of the Dome, the, the Dome of the Rock. You can see all of that. And between you and, and the ancient city is a valley, and that's the Kidron Valley. You're sitting there, and on the right hand side, as you go down that valley, is the Gethsemane, Church of All Nations. There it is. This mountain starts to the left, rises up, and goes all the way to the north. Solomon's temple is built kind of like this, but you can continue on further north, and there's a dip in it. And then on the end of it, on the other side of the dip, is Golgotha. Now, you folks that were here Wednesday night, I've told you about Golgotha, told you how it came into being. Uh, they, they, they quarried the stones to build the temple, but when they got to these stones, they weren't good enough, they weren't fit to build a temple from, so they left them. But the most remarkable thing is that when they left these stones, it appeared as the face of a skull. That's what Golgotha means. So there's a lot of people who believe, and I am one of them, that Golgotha is that northern extension of Moriah. The northern extension of Moriah. Okay? They found holes in the ground. They found a huge rock that's been cracked. And they believe that there Christ was crucified. There's a garden tomb right down from it. There's, a, there's an Arab bus station in front of it. And there on the northern end of Moriah is Golgotha. They believe the Jews. Ron Wyatt believes that the Jews took the Ark of the Covenant to that northern end. They we're talking about 621 B.C. They went in underneath that ground. And they went into a cavern. A kind of a place in there where they could store it. And they put the ark. They put the table of showbread. They put the, ark, the altar of incense. They put the seven golden candlesticks. They took the, the things from the holy place. And they put them in that area. And the ark is sitting there. 621 B.C., Christ shows up 600 years later. Now remember, these Jews have no idea that where they're putting this ark is going to be connected where Christ is crucified. They know nothing about Christ being crucified. They just put it there. But 600 years later, when the Lord Jesus Christ is nailed on a cross there on top of Moriah at the northernmost extension, when he's nailed on that tree, his blood flows down from that cross, flows through a crack in the rock. The crack in the rock came about because God shook the earth. That blood flowed down into that cavern where the Ark of the Covenant was placed. And the blood flowed down and literally flowed onto the Ark of the Covenant. And there it was until Ron Wyatt, excavating, went in there, and he found it. Now that is a, that's quite a story, isn't it? In the Old Testament, we know that when the high priest went in the Holy of Holies, he sprinkled blood. And he sprinkled it on the ark. The ark was inside the Holy of Holies. Always. Forever. Nowhere else. Unless it was being moved. So he sprinkled the blood on the ark. Therefore ratifying the covenant with blood. So, Ron Wyatt says that he found blood. He took the blood. He took samples of it. He said it was black. He took samples of that blood. And he had a little... How many of you remember film cameras? You remember film days before digital? I've got all kinds of little film jobs where you get your film out of it. you got a little thing about this. He had one of them with him. And he had a Coke can. And he had the stopper from the Coke can. He took it and he scraped the blood into the film container, about three quarters full. He took it to a laboratory. They examined that blood. And they said, after they examined it, they said, there's something different about this blood. They said, it's only got 23 chromosomes from the mother, and it's got one chromosome from the father, which is the Y chromosome. Now, all females have XX chromosomes. That marks you out as a female. If you're a male... You have another chromosome, which is an XY chromosome, which is the sex chromosome. And only men have that XY chromosome. Now, I did a little research into this a few months back, found out on a rare occasion a woman can have XY, but it's always an aberration and there's always a problem attached to it and there's something wrong about it. So he finds blood that has 23 chromosomes from Mary 
And it's got the Y chromosome from the Almighty. And they say to him, where did you get this blood? He told them, they said, this blood's alive. This blood is alive. And that blew his mind. Had been in there 2,000 years. Had 23 chromosomes, then had a Y chromosome. Which was, he says, is the blood of Christ. Now he has been ridiculed, maligned, drug across the coals like you wouldn't believe. Now let's say for a moment, he's wrong. This is all a show. This is all to make his name. This is all so he can publish books. This is all to make him famous. All right, let's say that's so. On his deathbed, and I think he died in 1999, on his deathbed, he swore that everything he said was true. He never deviated until his last breath that what he told and what he showed was true. He said while he was in there digging, he found a young man there named James in Jerusalem. He had to send his two sons home because they were sick. So James, he said, was trustworthy. He said he was a good man. So he helped him as he was doing the excavating underneath this. Now remember, we're not talking about the Temple Mount. We're talking about the northernmost extremity of Moriah. And James helped him while he was doing this work. He said James crawled back into a, this obviously, this, this area and said he could hear him in there. He said he came back out of there and said he was scared to death. His eyes full of terror. And he looked at him and said, I'll never come back in here again. And he went out and he never came back. So therefore, this young man, James, went into this place and apparently saw what Ron Wyatt saw. He saw it first. Ron Wyatt says he's encountered angels. He says this. Now, this is quite remarkable. He says he's encountered angels. And he says this. He said, let me say this. He said, this is a touchy point, and I try to avoid it. There's some 14 to 16 individuals that have died because they have tried in some way to manipulate this. That's quite remarkable, don't you think? Say, so why would it be, preacher? Let's think of the ramifications. Number one, Ron Wyatt is not a professional archaeologist. He doesn't have a degree in archaeology. The Israeli antiquities put, published a, a letter saying that what he says and what he has done is just all a bunch of fabrication, a bunch of junk, doesn't mean anything because he's not degreed by them. He's not, they don't oversee him. They don't control him. Now, let's say, for example, they did find the Ark of the Covenant. If they found the Ark of the Covenant, it would establish this once and for all and forever. That that Temple Mount belongs to the Jews, always has, always will. But number two. There are people in this world that would go to war in a heartbeat over that ark. That would be like a like a would be like throwing a match on gasoline. The ark of the covenant if it is produced, brought forth at the right time is all that it will take for Israel to come together like they have never come together before. Here's something else he said he found. He said when he found this, he couldn't see it all together, but he found all these implements, the, the Ark of the Covenant, table of showbread, seven golden candlesticks, all of that. But he said on the Ark, there was a little niche that had a scroll. And he said he was able to look at the scroll. And how he did this, I don't know, but he was able to look at the scroll. And he said, that was the book of Moses. When did Moses write that book? Remember the date of Moses? You're close. 1,400 years before Christ is Moses. What do you think would happen 
If somebody produced the original work of Moses, in other words, the book of Moses is the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, it's the Pentateuch. That's the book of Moses. If somebody produced that, all of these people, like this atheist that wants to eat human flesh, all of these screaming mad people today, these madmen, they would immediately be on the defensive. Because by producing something like the ark and the scroll and these things that are so old, producing them for the world to see would immediately say, the Bible's true. The Word of God is true. I say, what do you think then, preacher? I think this is possible. This is what I think is possible. That the Jews are very smart people. How many agree with that? I believe the Jews did hide the ark. How many agree with that? Oh, yeah. They didn't let him carry it off. I believe the Jews either have known from generation to generation or found out through Ron Wyatt what had happened to their lost ark. But they're not ready yet to go public with it. They're going to wait for the right time and the right place to produce the Ark of the Covenant. Remember this. The book of Revelation talks about the time of Jacob's trouble. The seven-year tribulation is not about the church. I know people are dragging the church into it left and right. Church is not in there, folks. We're gone. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Israel, during the seven-year tribulation period, begins to transform from the nation that gets run over by all the other nations unto the head of all the nations. And 144,000 of these Jews begin to preach the everlasting gospel. An angel flies through the heavens and tells you what they're preaching. And they're going to preach it for seven years. 144,000 of them. The Jews rise to the ascendancy. They rise. They come up. They become the head of all the nations. This Ark of the Covenant, if they've got it, and I don't doubt that the Jews have it, I'm just not certain that's it, but I do believe they have it. At the right time and the right place, they will produce it. How many of you ever heard that when the Lord told Moses to build the tabernacle, that he said, build it according to the pattern that you received from me in the mount? How many ever remember reading that? Moses didn't just come down all of a sudden and decide, well, let's see, let's, it will look good if we do it this way and this. No, he came down, built that ark, the, the tabernacle, exactly the way God told them to build the tabernacle. Why? Because what is up there is just exactly like what is down here. Have you ever really looked at Ezekiel chapter number 28 very closely? Where it talks about, thou wast in the holy mountain of God. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Satan. What holy mountain of God is he talking about? There's only one holy mountain, Moriah. Then you mean that there is a holy mountain, Moriah? Well, the Bible says that Mount Zion in the sides of the north, the city of the great king, right? Yes, it talks about Mount Zion in the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Mount Zion. There is a Mount Zion, then there's a Mount Moriah. There's an ark up there in heaven because we read about it in the book of Revelation. The ark. So what we're saying tonight is that everything on this earth, as it related to this holy site, has its counterpart in heaven, and it is the perfect pattern of what's up there. So when the Lord Jesus Christ left that Mount Zion, He came to this Mount Zion. When He left that Mount Moriah, He came to this Mount Moriah. Amen. He came from above down to here. When God made the man, he made him from the dirt of Moriah. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. Have you ever read in the book of Genesis where it says that there was a river that came out of Eden? Look carefully at what it says. It says there's a river that rises up out of Eden, then it is parted in four heads. The Hittichel... Tigris, Euphrates, we're talking about there, the Gihon and the Pison. Look at the Gihon. Look later on in the Bible where it talks about when, 
when, when they anoint the king of Israel, they took him down to the Gihon and they anointed him as the king of Israel to the, to the Gihon spring, the water that burst up out of the ground. You see, the water that feeds Jerusalem does not come from rivers that flow on top of the ground. The water that feeds Jerusalem comes from waters that pump, that come up out of the ground. Rivers of living water that flow beneath the surface of the ground. Siloam is fed with water that comes from beneath the surface of the ground. So Gihon comes up. And it feeds the whole earth, the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden goes all the way down into Egypt, all the way north into Syria, and all the way east into the Euphrates River, the, the Valley of Mesopotamia. It's a huge area, the Garden of Eden. Did you know that the Garden of Eden is the land grant that God gave to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15? Matches, it matches, it matches the, the geographical boundaries perfectly. That is Israel's land. And the water that feeds the millennium, the water that brings healing to the nations, will flow from underneath the Temple Mount and will go out and form a great river that cuts right through the Mount of Olives and goes down into the Dead Sea. It's water that comes up from there. It is a picture of the Holy Spirit of God. If you can believe the Bible, you can believe that your life started in Jerusalem. You can believe that you are born again by the one who died in Jerusalem. You can believe that everything that you believe and everything that you are and all of your identity is attached with one who died on a cross in Jerusalem. He was buried and he rose again the third day. And he rose for our justification. Then he said, I am the water of life. Amen. Living water. <laughs> Springs of living water. Hallelujah to God. So what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying everything that means anything is in Jerusalem. New York's as irrelevant as it can be. Knoxville, Tennessee doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean anything. Paris, France, Knoxville, Lund London, New York, San Francisco. <laughs> the only thing that matters is Jerusalem. That's what matters. Keep your eye on Jerusalem. Keep it on Jerusalem. I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone. Now, Ron Wyatt's gone on to be with the Lord. I believe he was a Christian. That much I certainly believe because of, what, because of what he said. He's also a lot of ways attached to the, to the although I don't know that he ever said that he was a Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, he was, in a lot of ways, he was associated with them. And uh, we probably have some, I've had Seventh-day Adventists visit with us here at Temple. Good night, man. We've had Church of God, Seventh-day Adventist, even uh, Assemblies of God. We've had uh, uh, Presbyterians and Lutherans, Episcopalians and Catholics and everything come here to Temple Baptist Church and visit with us. Are they welcome? Well, what if they do something to me? They're not going to do anything to you. <laughs> get them under the Word of God and you can get them saved if they're lost. Amen. <laughs> get them under the Scriptures. So I believe that this man certainly did... Uh, testify as to what he believed to be true. They put it that way. That's the best way to say it. He testified as to what he believed to be true. I do not believe that he was a liar. On the other hand, I will not say to you tonight that I know for certain that he found the Ark of the Covenant. Some other things could be in play. A lot of times people can have problems. Things can happen to them. But I will say this. I will say that just because the, uh, the uh, clique or the preacher society or the, the ruling elite in the, in, the, uh, in the Sanhedrin does not agree with this, that doesn't mean I have to kick it out. I'll do some praying over it. And let God speak to my soul. Let Him witness in my heart as to what I gave you is to be true or not. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's right. I think, I think Ron Wyatt mentions that. Yeah, he said it's no problem. The Ark of the Covenant is no problem. Boy. Hmm. Well, preacher, what's all that mean? It means the Bible's true. That's what it means. <laughs> 
That means Christ died for your sins according to the Scriptures. That's what it means. And that means that if you'll call upon His name, He'll save you. That's what it means. Amen. You can believe the book. Would if, 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 the, if, if they had found the original Gospel of John, let's just say John, and it had spots on it where John probably, when he wrote it, was sweating maybe. And it had the marks on it. It had the patina, the patina of a 2,000-year-old document. Would you like to see it? Oh, yeah. I'd go out of my way to see it. You better believe I would. I went up to Williamsburg, Kentucky to see a facsimile of the ark. Amen. You better believe I'd, I'd, you better believe I'd go out of my way like you wouldn't believe to see it. Yes, sir. Father, in Jesus' name, bless your word. I pray what I've said will help somebody. There may be a time now, and it may be soon, when this ark comes out. I don't know. Lord, nobody's told me anything. I don't know. But I'm certainly not going to be a hindrance to anything either. I'll just pray for it. Pray about it. I'll pray that you use this however you please. You know the truth of it. You know how much truth's in it. You know everything about it. Now pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake we ask it. Amen. All right.